during this program. If anybody has any questions, probably a little bit of a juggle, but put them in the chat or um, maybe after a certain period of time, Brian can stop and ask for questions and we have people in the room. So we're gonna bear with us. We'll make this work. Um, and uh, let's start the slideshow. Yeah, we're um, definitely in the chat. We'll keep an eye on the chat. So it's a good way to start. All right, can everyone see this all right? Perfect. So again, I want to thank you. Um, the next slide. And so uh, Pennsylvania's for Modern Courts was established there we go, over 30 years ago to help um, uh, to help instill confidence in the courts. There was a lack of confidence in our judiciary. The Pennsylvania's for Modern Courts was established to help support the merit selection, I would say, of uh, judges. However, we have morphed since then, and while we still support the merit selection of judges, we also do a lot of education about the courts system and access to the courts. We have this program, we have a series of programs with Montgomery County Library, which you hopefully will join us for. Um, but, you know, it is important to us that, that Pennsylvanians understand the importance of our judiciary, understand how our judges and judiciary work. We elect our judges in Pennsylvania. So when you elect your judges, you should understand what they do. Um, and I just want to uh, now introduce, I just put the slides down. I want to introduce Brian, who is Gordon, who is our presenter. Keep going. And, keep and, um, and Brian Gordon, it, I have I have known for years. He is um, he is actually a, I guess a relative by by marriage, maybe that would call it. That's right. But um, but he does a state for, and uh, I very much appreciate his joining us again. He is not giving any legal advice, uh, but he is here to provide information and and answer your questions, right? And uh, Brian is one of the kindest, warmest people I know. And so I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer some questions that you have, either if you think of it later or you know during this program. He has a tremendous amount of experience in state administration in not only Montgomery County, but our neighboring counties in Philadelphia as well. And uh, I think we're gonna pass this over to Brian. Great, thanks very much, Debbie. And um, welcome everybody to, to this, uh, this lecture. So the lecture is about how to administer a state in a county. And um, there are the slide deck was put together by some of us. Some of them are pink. Some of the slides are outstanding. So put over some and some of them are just a couple of the so next slide. Right? Yeah, a couple of preliminary things. Wait a minute, we can no, place no, that no, down. No, you're on different slides. Oh right, right. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Slide. Next slide. There we go. So the um, this is a lot of good information about just basic stuff. Um, the register wills uh, elected positions uh, in groups of weeks, and the office that he administers is at one Montgomery Plaza. That's the big office building across from the courthouse at 425 C Sweet Street on the fourth floor. You have to go through kind of like an airport security to go up and get that there, but they're, they're really helpful. Um, since COVID, though, they've asked me to call ahead um, because it seems to go back and forth between when you sort of show up in the office for advice. They don't officially give advice, but they give you the right direction. Um, or when you have to make an appointment, um, what do you want to know? You make an appointment in advance and then show up in light of the whole conversation. Um, I want to say that there are certain there are certain steps that individuals can take their estate, they can also hire someone. If they're not hire an attorney, my recommendation for clients hiring hire specialized counsel is to Google, Google the type of attorney you're looking for, the county, the county, and try to get you know, three of them, or at least you know, three of them, at least two. If you have a couple, ask for their rates. And in the state work as anything else, there's really a huge lot. Because you might have a recent firm that's here and 
doing dealing with the states over ten million dollars versus um, a lawyer who is happy to work with small states, medium sized states, or so, Brian, what is the Montgomery County Register of Wills? And that sort of pops out in your work. Who, who is the Register of Wills and what do they do? So, the Register of Wills is, is the, so the role of the, you know, so the, the Register of Wills um, does a few things. The most important function of the Register of Wills is that they're the place where after a lot of guys can come to work with. Pink is the final bill. That's where you lodge the will in this office, and that becomes the submitted. If you pull it any farther, it won't reach. Oh, I'll, so maybe slide closer. we need to get, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for letting us know that, that you couldn't hear. Okay, can you hear now? And I'll try to sit up and, and project a little bit better. So um, the register wills does several things. They do they, they deal with wills, they deal with marriage licenses, they do petitions for adoptions, and um, and they also do genealogical records, which is kind of a popular case. We're going to go back in time and find out, you know, find a lot, a lot about people and who they're related to from the wills that go back many, many years. Um, and this is all the way back to 1915. 1893. So Pennsylvania, you know, goes back to 1693. So they don't go back that far in this office, but you can probably get real. Um, the register wills is also where you go to probate an estate when someone dies. So I, I jotted down a couple of ways in which you could pass well from one generation to another. A will is only one of those techniques. And increasingly these days, it's kind of like a smaller part of your estate and it's going to, to pass wealth from a generation to another, you could do it by will, which is a document saying that you know this is this is this, this is a statement about the property too. And it really covers property that's in your individual name. Second, but you can also pass uh, property through a trust, which is saying I'm going to trust property according to certain terms. That's a simple explanation. You give money to a bank account. You have a joint account with a loved one, and they die automatically. Goes to them. You have a pay on death account, and then this is my account. When I die, that account's going to drop down to these three children, or these three, three individuals, or four individuals, whatever it is. But you can do it through that. Way. You can pass wealth through um, through a deed, and it's real property. You can have a deed to yourself, and one of your children. You have very few children. A deed is often a superior way to do estate planning because if it's just you and a child, you can use the property to you to yourself and a child. And then when you pass, it goes right down to the child. If there are other assets, you know, you know you have other qualifications, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great device. There's also um, retirement accounts like at work. You can automatically sign up for an IRA or a 401k or you create your own IRA. And those are governed by by ERISA statute, essentially, which says it pay. They have a beneficiary designation form. And if you write, when I pass, I give my IRA or my 401k to my spouse, and if you have a spouse, then to my children, and to share it to another person. It's kind of like a will, but just for that account. Another thing you can do life insurance policy that gets complicated because it's. You know, Policy that also has investment features. It's another way to pass wealth. It's something called annuity, which is a contract where you pay someone money, they invest it, and they pay it back to you or your family. There's a lot of ways to do this, but will is super important because for many of these you know, death things, if you have real estate, if you and your spouse, your spouse dies, just one person left, then if that person doesn't have a will, then you have to use the will that's written in the statute. And the, and the basic for the estate scheme is kind of a one size fits all statute designed to be every possible situation. It's written in a series of maybe 15 or 18 provisions, and it has to do with you know, who can die with the spouse, then they go to the spouse, and put the future spouse and get and the money. The children are all the children's inheritance. If you go to the future spouse, go to the kids. Well, the kids, if you go to your parents, Parents, you're going to send it to the siblings, you're going to 
nieces and nephews for their children. But this is all written in a stack. That's right. It's all written so in a series still, of statutes. And, and you this, don't, you right. Don't and and this statute can't, if you have no will, then the statute statutory process has to be followed. Is that correct? That's right. And you and you wind up going to the same place. If you wind up with it in a stray, even if you try to avoid it, or maybe try to have a account, you wind up with a single account. It's an individual name of the person who died. You got to go to the register of those office. And the first question is, do you have a will? And that's dying from testing. And if they have a will, they're usually going to say, I appoint so and so, my trusted spouse, if not spouse, then child, as the executor of the will. If there's no will in dying testate, then the um, then uh, someone can step forward and say, I would like to serve to administer the estate. In order for that person to be anointed by the register of wills with the clerk of the register of office, you have to everyone of that degree, all your siblings have to agree with that person. And they have to sign off on the notary and the renunciation. I should have a situation this year where an uncle wanted to take charge of his sister's estate or his mother's estate and he filed a false renunciation, fraudulent renunciation. He said, go all crazy. But anyway, test it and test it. Those are the, those are the test it. So it's better to be a will, but it's not the end of the road if you don't, especially if you have a conventional family where you've got to see who's going to split the money between the kids and just the see the kids. No big deal. It just goes to the kids. But you still, not only you could have an arm wrestle from who controls the estate. And that, if the arm wrestle was resolved, it was very expensive to resolve that. And you couldn't wind up with a property that was fallow. The bank can't not want it. The bank account was fallow for seven years. It goes to the treasurer. You end up the treasurer. If a property was fallow for long enough to spend so the So, using the term was fallow, what does that mean? Unadministered. If you don't administer the estate. Have a, you could have a property worth with hundred thousand dollars, and it's a modest property. And you could wind up you have three kids, each of them could be after expenses, you know, twenty five, thirty thousand dollars. And that money's going to go if the if the property gets swallowed up. So I guess so. The question is, do I need to probate and save? It's a question. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> it is right. So the question is, do you need to probate the estate? And the answer is, is if the decedent owns real property, meaning real estate, or personal property, like bank accounts, that was titled in his or her name alone, at the time of death, the estate needs to be probated. It could be real property, like, like real estate, like your homes, it could be bank accounts, cash, personal items, it could be probate property, and that's property that can only be transferred by going through probate. That would be property individual name, non-probate property. So non-probate property is what I've been talking about when you have like a joint account or if you have a benefits or designation form. You don't need to go to the Next slide. This is just a uh, spreadsheet yeah. question. This is actually really interesting. So this was prepared by someone else and I really, I really like it. It's a little complicated, but I just want to give you a practical real oh, it's real that arrow. <laughs> Sorry, one hour is a little long. Right 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 you do not need to probate the estate. So one time, about two years ago, I had a mom. Her husband died. I wrote through will. Mom and daughter were all sitting. We got we arrived at the register of wills in Philadelphia. We're all sitting in the chairs. And we're like, okay, tell me what accounts you have. So we went through a list of four accounts. Not one was an individual. Literally, we're in this chart here. But we've got to find this. Uh, I said, "Wow, <laughs> here, there's no, there's no, there was no property left in individual name of the person who died." So I, I said, "I'm so sorry, I didn't know that, but you know, separate ways can avoid probate. They're all fine. And, uh, they're very nice people, so they wouldn't have." So the question is, did the deceased own property? If yes, was the property jointly owned? If no, does all the property that the jointly owned have made beneficiaries? Right? The same, so the same questions. Then you need to go to probate. If no, they didn't name a beneficiary. So if you have, for example, a an IRA, an IRA like had your husband, but your husband predeceased you, 
as well. No secondary beneficiaries of those two estates can be on the property estate. Or, for example, uh, does the property, was all the property jointly owned? Yes, that arrow is for the people sitting in the Registry of Wills Office from the day they not <laughs> the probate estate. <laughs> I mean, that, right. that means you need to make sure that when you have some, when you come in to see a lawyer and have a conversation, you need to have all your paperwork together, right? It'll save you time, it will save the lawyer time, and it will save you money. Right. So you need to make sure that you gather the documents that you think you have, you know, that maybe say joint account on them or, you know, so that's very important. Right. Excellent. Do I need a lawyer to probate an estate? Answer is no, you don't need a lawyer. A lawyer is not legally required. Um, having a lawyer to assist the estate is extremely helpful because they're knowledgeable and they have experience. Using a lawyer from the beginning of the probate can prevent problems down the road, and there can be personal liability for the executor. For the executor, the estate is not administered. So that's important, right? Because, yeah. you know, as an executor, you really, you know, you when you're when you're dealing with a will. Most often, there's a lot of emotions that surround the situation, right? And so, um, sometimes your head is not always level. I'm, I'm trying to be right. nice, right? right? So, so it's important that the you know, and, and this is a lot of pressure and responsibility for an executor, and right. it also has repercussions down the road. So, let me give you a couple of examples. So, we're great to be an executor, and there's real money in the state. You can get that in trouble. So, for example, suppose there's real estate and the, you're like, well, the property's insured because the decedent had it insured, but it's secretly hidden in most insurance policy says that the 30 days after someone's died, in order to get it insured, the estate's in. You can add the estate, and sometimes they won't. Sometimes I say, no, if you don't deal with the state property, especially for vacant, and then you have to get special insurance. Mm -hmm. right? and I, so I had this estate, fascinating estate, where this, this woman met a guy in there, and it's a true story. They dated for 10 years. He wanted her to write a will, and so she got a big giant property in Bucks County. And, um, and he, had, he was so greedy, he was trying to like, she was like, she was battling cancer and like, don't go to the doctor, go to my lawyer first. And she took a face to that. Believe it or not. Good. <laughs> Good. So, she knew what he was up to. So she solved the problem. She solved the problem by by um, not writing a will at all. Okay. So everything went to her sibling. She's eight. She's Chinese. Everyone her siblings three, like five of them in Hong Kong, and two of them in the States. And the boyfriend got sick. Nothing. But the boyfriend refused to leave the home. And um, I'll back this <laughs> The boyfriend refused to leave the home. And fortunately, I attended a lecture, a continuing legislative education class, like many years, 15 years ago, they said, you have property, make sure the property's insured. Right? So I'm like remembering this. And I dealt with the insurance company and I made my client, who was the captain, I like her to get it. And just named the estate as the additional insurer of the policy. And they're willing to do this. They're all companies do this. And I wanted to actually make it the primary insurer that was swapped off, but there was this additional insurer. A, a week before the sale of the property, I got a call saying, saying the boyfriend, who we we're still trying to like get out of our pro pro get out of the property, invited the neighbor in the early hours over to the property for coffee. And the neighbor the neighbor fell on some uneven surface of the papers in the back because the decedent had met had guys from work put the papers in instead of actually hiring a trading company. And it really was a defect. And the guy fell and he uh, broke uh, his back. I'm not serious. You don't think it was that serious, but he fractured his spine in some way on the seats in the back a week before the sale was to happen. Right. So, not sticking up. Oh, okay. So stare that way. Yeah. Maybe I'll go if you pull it any pull farther, it. You pull it. Gotcha. Maybe you. We're gonna slide. Maybe try and you should go across. Yeah. Actually, 
you can push the advance the slides okay. too. Okay. Like. Right here. One second, guys. We're gonna fix this. We're gonna fix this. We're gonna fix this. We're gonna fix this. Thanks for being our guinea pigs today. So anyway, the moral of the story is that you can really mess up an estate if you you if you can make a mistake, and then if you really do make a mistake, or if you if you if everything's invested in you know Apple stock and then Apple suddenly plunges. So they'll point the finger at you saying, you screwed up, you should have diversified your investments, but you know things can happen. And it is a really good idea at a minimum to hire an attorney to coach you through the process and get advice. And at the maximum, if you're really busy and, and, and you just wanna say, you know what, it's, a big, it's a nice size estate, so this is great. just have the attorney do it. You told us one of the problems for the inexperience. If you go to the next slide, yeah. there's a number of other areas that can that can actually present problems, um, you know, for uh, for those who want to take this on on their own. Yes. So payment of creditors. Okay. There's a certain priority. Now, if you have what's called a bankrupt estate, you gotta get an attorney. This is super important, right? So if you have more debts than you have assets, the estate has to be handled really carefully because nobody gets paid until the very end. And then if there's only, you know, if, there, if the debts are twice the size of, as the assets after paying taxes and everything, or forget about taxes, but if the debts are twice the size of the assets, then all the creditors are gonna get paid half. The estate is run like a bankruptcy. And I have, I have handled an estate where someone was tried to do it themselves, paid out money, and made him basically had to wind up digging out of his own pocket because, because they didn't uh, follow the priority. Priority we'll get into later. We have Medicare, Medicaid claims. They have to be negotiated. Sometimes they're zero. Sometimes they're more money. Even in credit cards. But, but Medicaid claims can be negotiated. Like, don't what are Medicaid claims? What are Medicaid? Medicaid Medicaid claims are claims. So suppose the the decedent was on Medicaid, meaning they were getting government support, and then there is a house. I actually have oh, okay. so like a house. Medicare. So I had this I had this situation where someone came to me and she took care of her mother for the last five years of the mom's life. And there's an exemption in the Medicaid statute that if, a, if your family member takes care of you at the home for more than two years, the house is exempt from being mm -hmm. clawed back into Medicaid. And and I wrote a long letter. She didn't quite fit, she was pretty close, I wrote a long sympathetic letter and won the house for her. Okay. Because if there's Medicaid outstanding, they're going to make a claim and try to grab monies from the estate. Thanks. Appreciate it. I wish we're, they're going to get better class because you're because you're filling the gaps. Because <laughs> you've seen this lecture before. I'm just jumping in. Okay. Uh, and then this question of who pays the taxes. Very interesting question. Most people think well, the estate pays the taxes. Not if the estate doesn't have that much money. And only if the, there's a will, and the will says the estate pays. If the will doesn't say, if there's no will, or if, the, or if there's a will that doesn't have that provision in it, then the beneficiary owes the tax. But the, exec, the administrator still has a duty to collect, and there may be joint liability. I haven't really studied that issue, but it's interesting. Who pays the expenses? This is really important, because even if you have an insolvent estate, if someone laid out $20,000 for the funeral, the burial, the, the, the priest, whoever, they get reimbursed right off the top because of the priority. I think we're going to get priority. And so we do tell people to make sure that they keep, you know, keep their expenses because among siblings, they may have some disputes as to expenses and, and how much they really spent and so on. You know, we tell people to make sure you keep track of all your expenses. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> I was going to say, and Debbie's sister, my sister-in-law, who's very well organized, when my mom passed, it was like a, a day. And I had, I, she just handed me a file. She yes. handed me a file and she got them all out the and receipts for everything. I mean, important. everything. Very well organized. So next slide. Sort of touched on. Yeah. So the beneficiaries, parts of the estate, beneficiary designation estate. I, I think you can skip this one. Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, let's go to the next one. All right, probate basics. So, can, oh, it's gonna, so who, the executor, so 
The executor named in the will or the seed's next of kin when there is no will should gather the required documents. So this is like how to do probate, right? This is, so who does it? So the, if there's a will, the executor, the executor steps forward with an original will, with, with a original death certificate, with their original ID. It used to be in the old days, it was easy. You just walked in the register of wills or made an appointment. And now it's, you have to make an appointment in advance and say, here we go, I'm ready to roll. So if there's no will, then you have to get the generation all to agree. Each of them have to have notarized renunciations to appoint one of one or more of you as the executor or administrator or co-administrator. So it's state. just the immediate children of the deceased? Right, but suppose there are no children of the deceased. Okay. Maybe they're just siblings. Then the sibling step forward. Right. Suppose a young person passes and the parent's still alive. And the parent could, so anyone in the chain, anyone in the chain of, of inheritance is pretty much the same chain of who can step forward and administer them. Okay. Um, when there are no absolutely no family members, a creditor can step forward and administer an estate. So I've had that situation. Okay. All right, next. next question. Covered by this. Probate steps. This is a great slide. So I'm going to go through this in detail. First, find the original will and determine who was a named executor. If there was no original will, determine who is the next of kin. Okay, and that you might need to look it up on, online. You can also go to an attorney. This is where you need advice and helps. Determine who's willing to serve as an executor or administrator of the estate. Even if someone's named as an executor, maybe they just had a baby or maybe they just Maybe they're just not, they just have a new job. They don't have the time for it. So a good exec, I mean, maybe they just not at a point in their life where they can deal with it. Right? You want someone who has the time and the willing to do it. So if someone's named and they really don't want to serve, but they're, they're perfectly, they have trust in their sibling or brother or sister, then they said, look, you can serve, that's fine. You can, all, you can correct what a will, you know, gets wrong if it's not the right time in someone's life. Who's willing to serve? Obtain a copy of the death certificate. That is usually done by asking if uh, if there's been a prop, a burial with a um, with a funeral home. The funeral home will ask you how many death certificates do you need. Always ask for a few extra, even Just though they cost money. It is so important because if banks actually ask for for death certificates, you need more than one copy and you don't want to keep going back and it needs to have the original stamp on it so mm -hmm. make sure you ask for more than one death certificate at least a half a dozen at least have a dozen <laughs> but basically you need one death certificate you should get one death certificate and later you'd be asked for uh something called a short certificate which is proof of who's appointed but you want one of each of those for each institution mm -hmm. or each big asset like a real estate like if it's a if it's a piece of real property so you, you want to get a, a number of those. Um, obtain, complete the estate information sheet and petition for grant of letters. So there are online and you can usually wander. So this is a really important thing. If you want to try to do it yourself or want to learn more about the process, go on to the Register of Will site. I'm looking at folks who are here. Um, go into the Register of Will site and wander around the site and look for the process. Read about the process. It's really the best way to get it. Well, I found the process, but, but then I had to, then I ended up in the hospital. So yeah. I didn't, I didn't. It wiped you out, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, you need, you need a lawyer. You, know, yeah. you might need a lawyer, at least as an advisor. And, yeah. and when I was started practicing, the lawyers did everything soup to nuts, and they just said, this is the charge. And some lawyers still operate that way. But, it's not a huge estate, though. I right. But I learned that, us, you know? No, don't worry about it. But I learned that, yeah. that some people, like someone's an accountant or an engineer, and they're really meticulous, they, they could, and they want to do it themselves. They want to do it themselves. That's fine. Just a lawyer oh, can, yeah. can, yeah. There you go. Whatever you want. Whatever, whatever fits your thing. OK. So you must bring, next thing is, so there's an estate information sheet, it's online, there's a petition for grant of letters. These are unnecessarily duplicative documents, but you gotta fill them out so anyway. So if you turn to the next slide, there is a sample Wait. of an estate yeah. but I understand, I remember that. Back. But we're gonna finish this slide now. <laughs> I'm gonna the, come back. The executor or minister, bring photo ID. 
you got to bring photo ID and now you have this Zoom thing and you got to show your driver's license. We got to have your driver's license or other ID, photo ID. So that's interesting. So during COVID, you actually had to show your photo ID on the camera to the register of Will's office. You actually had to make a photocopy of both sides, mail it in to oh, prove your identity. Interesting. And then okay. sometimes he would just, sometimes because out of habit, they say, can you show me your ID? And he'd pull it out. He'd hold it up to the screen. <laughs> wow. Wait, is this working? You hold it up to the screen. Uh -huh. like that. Wow, that's, really interesting. <laughs> that's what we did. And sometimes, like to show signatures, we would say, you know, scribble, scribble, scribble. And so they want to watch you sign. It. They want to watch you right. sign. And then I have my clients hold their signature up to the screen to show they right. signed it. Like, okay, okay, got it. We believe you. Right. But that's, <laughs> you have to adapt. Right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. All right. So, the executor administrator must submit the original will if one exists. And if you find one later, you should submit it after the fact. Certified copy of the death certificate, the state information sheet, petitions for grant of letter, probate fee. You gotta bring a check, you gotta be ready to write a check. It's one of the only offices they'll take a they'll take a personal check as opposed to just an attorney check. Some of them get sick of bounce checks and they'll just, you just have to take a, get a money order or something or pay by credit card. And it's in, interesting, we're talking here about the Montgomery County Register of Wills. Different counties have different requirements and rules. So it is important if for some reason you're, you've joined us and you're not from Montgomery County, you know, please make sure that you look at your county's website for the Register of Wills. Right. The probate fee is determined by an estimated value of the estate and it varies by county. So it's best to call the register of wills in advance to give an idea if you want to get a pretty good idea of what your probate fee Could is. Can I ask a question about the estate? Now, does the estate, does that also include things like insurance? The probate fee is based on, it does not include insurance, but includes all, all bank accounts and all real estate in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Okay not other states. Other states, you have to do a separate administration called an ancillary. So if you have property in Maine or in Cape Cod or New Jersey, you got to do it in ancillary administration and go through a lot of this again. Okay, in the state we have the property. Next slide, please. Cover sheet, petition for granted letters. Use both for, yeah, this one you use for both, for both wills and intestate estates. Should be completed by the executor and just basic information like the name of the seed, their social security number, basic ID stuff. What's the what's the administrator's name, phone number, email address, address. How do we, how do we? And then you have. Um, and the forms are all found online mm -hmm. at pa.courts.us/form/for-the-public/organs-court.forms, but they are there. Right. So so the other program. thing is you can Google. Um, PA Orphan's Court forms, just Google it, but then you have to sort through the commercial sites and try to get one that is like an, has an official WW, you know, official address, so you don't wind up paying for form that's free. Okay. Yeah, don't Google it, just take those as yeah. <laughs> Like I remember once like trying to get just an employer identification number for the IRS, I'm like, oh my God, there's like six of these things. Yeah. They will charge you for the, the most common form possible. Don't do that. Okay, next slide. So you're getting good non-legal advice. You're getting good information. All right, also known as the probate. Oh, there's your petition for grant of letters. Now, I my vision isn't, but this has the basic information, but they're going to want to know the decedent's name. It's very it, similar. Other it's names. Just another form that has to be filed with the yeah. register. This one's, I, I, don't, I don't get this. This is like a repetitive form, but then again, I don't run the office. So use for it should be completed by the executor to see this next kin and the person who steps forward to administer the estate. It's a statewide form. You Google PA petition for granted letter, letters, enter, and then you'll find it. Again, look for that official website, mm -hmm. PA courts website, because they really have a nice and scroll down to register wills. It's there. And that's where you find Excellent. it. Okay. After probate. So so what happens is you you suppose you you either don't have a will and they say, all right, we recognize your renunciations, you're the point person. Then they'll issue something called letters of administration to you. If you have a will where you're named as the executor, they'll issue letters testimony. They're basically the same thing. It's just different Latin language, which 
or different language is about to describe each one. A short certificate, and it's important because if a judge is reviewing this later on or if anyone else is reviewing this, it's a cue to, do I need to look for a will or don't I, right? That's why they're called different things. A short certificate is a certificate that provides information about the estate and the executor or administrator's name. Uh, these can be ordered from the register of wills. Sometimes you run out of short certificates if you have a lot of different accounts that you're dealing with. And you can, it's, it's annoying, but you can get more. There, sometimes there's special form, there's a small fee, it varies by county, just call the register of wills office and they'll help you out. Letters and short certificates give the executor power over the account. So if you go to a bank and you want to get, you want to try to, try to ask them to liquidate an account, they're going to ask for three things. And they're going to ask you for your ID. They're going to ask you for a tax identification number. We'll talk about that in a second. And they're going to ask you for where your letters of administration or letters testamentary proving you're the person in charge of this, that you have the power. Now, once that you're once you're appointed as administrator or executor of an estate, and the best way to view that is you then stand in the shoes of the decedent to, to wind up their affairs. So you can you can you can rent out property on a temporary basis, you can you can sell property, you can evade accounts, but you have the same power that you can sue and you can be sued, right? And you want to be sued because you're like, if it's this, you, you're the point person. And you can be sued in, in your capacity as executor of the estate. And you're really limited to the, your liability is limited to the amount in the estate unless you make a, unless you're negligent. Right, keep going, <laughs> thank you very much. Off, you can tell I go off on a tangent. Okay, What's next? next slide. And somebody just, oh, this see, is a list of your basic This points. is a great list, so this list, is a great list of steps. There are 10 steps on how to administer the estate. You get sworn in, you get obtained letters and short certificates or short certificates. You then have to fill out this form to provide notice to beneficia beneficiaries and heirs that an estate is being administered and, you, and a person has been appointed as the executor or administrator. Then you have to advertise the estate in two different papers. Uh, this is one. a requirement. Why? It's actually, it's a law a that's law. often ignored, yes. but it is the law. It's right. ignored because it's expensive to admit. So if you have a small estate, you could like flout the law, but I'm not advising you to do that. But this, <laughs> this is, you're supposed to advertise the estate and it gives notice. It's really crazy because you have to, a little tiny notice in a newspaper gives notice to the so world the of purpose, predators. The purpose is to give you notice. Know, just like the cheapest local paper. It can, oh, yes. absolutely. So a lot of banks, right, ha have people, have, have, people that are just looking at the estate notices or there are services now there are companies now that just you know once you just monitor electronically because once you advertise in the state it's also in that papers electronic system and they can be searched now and there are some people who just read the estate notices because they want to know who died right <laughs> that's more like an older generation of them, right <laughs> Yeah, most people don't get newspapers anymore. <laughs> right. right, that's the problem. Right. But, but what's interesting school. is that it does, you know, the the law is has not kept up to real world in real time, yeah. and it still does require two publications in newspapers. In print. Two different newspapers, three successive publications, one legal, one right. the legal newspaper in the county that's been designated, and one any newspaper of quote general circulation. And general circulation could be Philadelphia Tribune, Jewish Exponent, whatever, okay? Interestingly enough, but there you go. So the next thing you wanna do is you wanna get an EIN from the IRS. That's an employer identification number. You can't open an estate account without getting, a, your estate is like opening a business. It's a separate entity. And you have to get a, a tax identification number for that entity. And there, once again, you wanna type in uh, EIN or tax identification number, and um, sorry, my phone is back. Sorry about that. Um, tax identification number, and you want to Google that, but you want to try to avoid the six or so sites where they'll charge you for something that's absolutely free. You want to find the the IRS site, click into it, and then there's a series of questions they'll ask you. 
if you go to an attorney and an experienced the attorney can get through these questions in like 10 minutes. You do it on your own it could take you an hour. <laughs> right. right? The first time you did it, you're like, what? How many employees? Like, what are we? Anyway, it's very confusing. All right. Uh, then you want to prioritize, you know, identify. This is super important. The next thing you want to do is you want to make a list of all the assets owned by the decedent and then all of the debts of the decedent. Right. Very important to keep a good list. You can start off by using an Excel spreadsheet or just a piece of paper. It doesn't matter. Just, just be methodical. Um, you want to prioritize the debts. Deb? So, meaning certain certain entities, there may be older debts, certain entities like the government may require priority payment over others. Um, if there are lawsuits out there with, with judgments, you just, you need to be able to figure out which debts are, uh, need to be answered, need to be paid first uh, so that you as the executor would not, will not be on the hook. Right. But again, as I say, all debts can be negotiated. So when you put your debts on a list, you know, that list you can call and say, look, I only have this much money in this state, so we can't pay you fully. And most creditors are, are willing to compromise. Right. Something, one, is better than something I learned about four years ago, just before COVID, I was representing a hot dog vendor who died. They may have the most interesting estates. He owned three different very valuable properties, and his common law wife came in. Who is that's another story, but she really was a common. She predated the common law wife statute, so she really was the common law wife. She came in with a stack of cards. It was like a deck of cards, but it was about three times as thick as. And these were all the guy's credit cards. So he was financed his entire life, and he had like thirty credit cards. And some of them, some of the debts were really aged. And I was, I was trying to negotiate each one. And then they call. Anyway, this is the secret, is that in the fine print, they can't lie, right? You got to read the fine print because some of those said that the debt is no longer collectible, but they were still trying to collect it. Right. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so there is a slide that's called pay debts. All right, we're good. And it says- it's Oh, wait, wait, before we leave that. statutory them. priority. Let me, let me whip through the rest of these things. So you got to okay. prioritize the debt, file an estate inventory, if it's filed with the tax return. You have to file a Pennsylvania inheritance tax return. Very rarely a federal estate tax return. And you have to file income tax returns like the last year of life for the person who died. And in a rare instance, if you have an estate account, a state that's open and you, it has property that dramatically increases in value, significantly increases in value, so then you might have to file an, an estate return for a year or two. So there you go. Like a normal tax return, usually. Uh, you want to file the, you want to sign and family? I don't have any, but if people on Zoom heard that question, because that's a good question. Mm -hmm. The question was, when do you file the tax return in the year that the person passes or do you file it in the next year when the tax return is so due? Let's answer the question properly. You can file the tax. The taxes won't be due until April of the year following the day, mm -hmm. right? And when you open your estate, you have an EIN number, you want to write December as the date that you're, as your tax year so that you can push it off to the next, you know, to the next April, mm -hmm. right? And then it's, a, it's at a time when you're expecting to pay taxes, you won't miss it or forget about it. So you definitely, you, you want to do that. And then, but you could file the return early and you can pay your taxes early. You got to work with an accountant. So my philosophy is for an estate return, work with an attorney or an accountant who's experienced in doing estate returns. Or for the last year individual return, always call the family across and find out who filed the returns. The person did themselves, hire an accountant will do a much better job than a lawyer and it'll be cheaper and better. Hire an accountant who knows what they're doing. Okay, so not a sorry. lawyer for the tax so returns, true. right? And oh, by the way, we didn't say this, but this will be sent to you. Anybody on the phone or here, this PowerPoint will be pro provided to you okay. after. And this is a great list. This is a super list. So you thought you have to pay your taxes and then, you, and then you're done. Then once you pay all the debts, they didn't say pay the debts. Once you pay the debts, pay the taxes, you pay all the liabilities, then you have a net estate. You pay the executor, you pay the attorney, you pay the accountant, and then you're done. You're then you're you're done. Then you have to distribute the money. But before you do that, you want to get 
releases from everybody, you want to say, here's your accounting to your sibling or your children or the other people. And you want to say here, and the optimal, ideally, you want to get, you want to present an accounting and have them sign a release saying, you've done a good job. I bless what you've done. I'm not going to sue you. And then you distribute the money. That's generally the sequence of things. You can be less formal as informal as you want, but that's how a lawyer would handle it to protect the executor. Okay, sign family agreements, then you distribute the estate, and then you close the estate with a final document, a one page or two register of wills, saying we've stated an account to the family members, or we, if everyone's disagreeing and fighting, you can file a petition with the orphans court to bless the administration of the estate. That is unbelievably complicated and difficult. Um, and you generally need an attorney to, to get through that process. So if you can work it out and come to an agreement, much better than going to court, which is really designed for pretty large estates because of how difficult and challenging it is. But it can be done. It's doable. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay. So we are, we have only 10 minutes left, Brian. So okay, you know. next slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But we've covered a lot of this. So uh, notice the beneficiary of heirs. We already did this. Right. You just yeah. follow the notice. It's that this is the most self-explanatory notice. You have to, it's there's a form, you got to fill it out, you got to state. And interesting, you don't have to attach the will, but I find that disclosure is the best policy. Attach the will, share it with everybody so they know what's going on. Otherwise, they have to make their way to the register of wills office to see the official copy of the will. Next. Advertising the estate. We've already went through this. Mm -hmm. So legal journal, paper of general circulation, call the estate advertising department, runs once a week for three weeks. Statute of limitations. Oh, the advantage of advertising an estate is that if you have like a contract statute of limitations, it would be six years from when the contract was made. Then you can limit the limitations period to one year from the third advertisement. So it limits the limits the claims of creditors. So creditors cannot come back. Also, right. creditors, creditors, it says they need to file a statement of claim. They kind of don't need to file a statement of claim, but it really protects them if they do. Then the administrator can't ignore it. The creditors can just send you a bill. Can you know, the doctor can send you a bill? You got to pay it. If you, if you have actual notice as an executor of a bill, you have to pay it. That's something we were wondering about. It's like medical bills sometimes take like months to show up. Right. Plus, it has to, you have to make sure that the insurance. The doctor has presented it to the insurance carrier and the insurance carrier has reduced yeah. it and all that kind of stuff. So it could take months. If so, it says, well, how long is it be for, until I get my money? <laughs> Minimum six months, nine months, a year. These are all normal periods of time to admit during the estate. You don't want to rush it because if you pay out the estate and then a big claim comes in after it's a tax return, then you're in trouble. And, and that's, a, and that's really important. I mean, you may think that it is a simple situation, not too complicated, but you could be surprised when some creditor comes up, you know, comes out of the blue a couple months later and and hits the estate or is surprised surprises the estate with a very large bill. Right. So you really anytime you distribute money before the statute of limitations ends, it's a risk distribution. It's pretty commonly done, but the lawyer would advise if you have an elderly person who paid absolutely every bill and the risk is low. Yeah. If you have someone who is like the guy with like a million credit cards, the risk is a little higher, okay. right? You want to have a reserve. You don't want to distribute everything. Right. You want to have a concept of reserve. Too. That's very important. Like don't distribute right. the whole estate. Keep like 30, keep a reserve. Keep a 30 keep percent in yeah. a reserve for an extra year. And then you can just yeah. like then give an accounting of that reserve to your siblings or whoever and you're done. Complete an inventory. Where are we? Oh, I'm to the next slide. Oh, yeah. Okay. Make a list of the decedent's assets. We did this, right? Yes, we did. Close the accounts. Close the credit cards. Determine the date of death values. Open an estate checking account. You did that. You did that. We already we did, did this. this. You did. You're so efficient. Yeah. Inventory form. Oh, so when you file an inheritance tax return, there's a second form you have to file called an inventory. It has to be filed nine months from the date of death. And then word to to well, a little information, not advice, is if the tax if there is inheritance tax owed, if you pay it within three months of the date of death, based on estimated assets and liabilities, you get a five percent discount. Mm -hmm. And if it's a big estate, it makes a big makes a difference. Yeah. You can save hundreds of dollars. Wow, 
So file the with the registry. Yeah, you have to file the pro. The, this thing is you just file it with the PA inherent section. They're both due nine months after the day of death. The statewide form used across PA in every county, and it's actually a very easy form. To fill. Yeah, one thing I wondered about is you have to pay uh, inherent tax on IRAs. Question was, do you have to pay inherent tax on IRAs? I've researched this many times. If the if the person was over fifty nine years of age, and they had the power to change the beneficiary. The IRA is includable in the estate. But if they're under 59, talk to an accountant or check their will three times. 93. <laughs> okay. Next 93, slide. yeah. It's includable. It's includable. Okay. Then you're filing taxes. You have, so you want to file the decedent's final income tax returns. Oftentimes, the person has like money coming back to them, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes they get a refund. And now you don't even know if they're going to get some COVID check, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you want to file those tax returns, right? Okay. We went through so this. here's the priority of the debts because we had asked. So this is there is a priority in the statute yeah. as to how debts should be paid. This off. is really important to know. So it's really important for a state lawyer to know, but it's important for anyone handling it to know. If you're having a, if you don't have enough assets to pay everything. The administrative expenses are number one because that's like people laying out money to it, like the probate fees, the attorney, that kind of stuff, they're number one. The family exemption is like if you, if you have a loved one dying at home and you get some family exemption, it's pretty high up and it, it's to help people in that situation. It's kind of rare. Um, I have to sort of reread that statute. I can't really talk more about it without checking the statute. Funeral and burial expenses. This is really important that this is high up on the list because what it means is that if someone, it means is you can pay that, those funeral and burial expenses early on in the administration. You're almost never going to get in trouble for doing it, even if you don't administer the whole estate. That's a bill you can pay early. We've already That's done that. So we've already paid money. But you get reimbursed. Remember, you also get reimbursed early. So before you distribute the money to sibling, make sure that people who lay out the money for the funeral and burial are reimbursed. Then there's Medicaid and medical bills in the past six months. So if their medical bills older than six months before death, then they're just general in the general pile of bills. It's not you can ignore it. And then there's a grave marker. Can I tell a story? Can I tell a story on this one? Yes, but you were great. We have four minutes left, and I don't know if there's <laughs> we any questions. Any questions? There's there so. one question in there. All right. Okay. So, so there, you you pay a grave marker. I'll see, save the thing. You pay rent for the seed. You can pay rent claims of the Commonwealth. This is great. I haven't read this in years. All other claims include credit cards. <laughs> Good to know. I haven't had a lot of insolvent states. So, you know, let's let's put this right, in perspective. That's true too. There, no, no, I would bet that most. Numbers, but a good number of estates are insolvent and, to, and are not able to pay. Also, a good number of lawyers have actually never read the intestate laws. Right. Mm. <laughs> it's a good thing to read. It's like, oh, wow, look at that. Okay. So, I mean, I've we, read them. We just, just the next slide has discusses distribute assets. We did discuss that. And we did um, this three times. Transfer of next real slide. property. There is a slide there. I don't think we touched on about transfer of real property. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you have a property that's to be transferred under, um, under the will, so if there's no one named, and this gets comp real property is complicated, but if there's no one named, then is receiving real property. <clears throat> and it's just, you should probably sell the property and hire a professional real estate broker and get the highest possible value. And then the net goes into the estate and you distribute it to your to the three, four, however many children. And there you go. Okay. If, um, if the the will says that this property goes to person A as one of my, and then the rest of the estate goes to goes to his two sisters as one of my estates. Right now, I'm working on. You follow that, and there has to be you have something called an executor's deed. So the person who has, is the executor administrator, they actually will sign the deed and the agreement to sell the property. To hire a broker, agreement of sale, and sign the deed, and they'll sign all those forms. And it's a really, that's the other reason it's really important if someone appointed. Okay. So the, if the executor is taking wool, maybe. Executor. I was just don't worry. Yeah, let's next keep slide. going on to the next slide. Right. Family okay. settlement agreements. Yes, family yeah, settlement agreements are favored yeah. by, the, by the courts because they uh, resolve a lot of fights. So that's like you, you state, this is what happened. This is what everyone's getting. Everyone signs off on it. Or if you're doing something unusual, 
you can vary the terms of a will. You can vary what happens according to statute if everybody, everybody agrees. agrees upon it. Right. And it's, it doesn't have to be a formal document, you know, but it should be written clearly. So, because this is a document that will be presented to a court. Right. Uh, full accounting, full formal accounting is, is a, there's a very formal accounting that's written into the statute as a recommended form. It is very difficult to understand. And you have to do that if you're going to court. You pretty much have to do that. If you're going to court and you have to fill out a very long informational sheet for the judge. And it takes hours and hours to really do these things right. Beware of claims of creditors. Once you advertise the estate, the one year statute of limitations should pass before you distribute the money. If you have, unless you have one of these estates where mom or dad never let a debt buy, always pay their bills, then you can risk it. You might want to risk it, but so it's, up, it's a risk. The next slide. Next, next slide. slide. We are almost done. Oh, well, we are. Wait, okay. and we missed the slide. Close. Closing the estate. the estate. When all the property is transferred, file the status report that says the administration is complete. It must be filed with registry world every two years at when an estate's open, or an annoying letter is going to come either to the attorney or to the to the administrator saying, "Hey, where's your where's your status report?" Statewide form can be used in all counties. It's a very simple form, and it's either you you, you state the estate's done or the estate's still open every two years. It's a good form. Next slide. Next slide. Is a question. So we, we made did it. it under the gun, but I think you said that there was a question online. There was a question in the chat. Let's, let's pull that up. I can't see it from here because my eyes are not done. You got to X. Yeah. No, no, you don't have yeah. the dots. It should be the dots, maybe? More. Check. It's okay. Up the top. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. How, okay. Have, Can have, Brian speak louder? <laughs> we, oh, we got that. We got that one. <laughs> How can I help my kids to pay less tax for the house after I pass? Great question. So, if you, so this is where I am not giving advice that's customized to a situation because this is like not, this is tricky, but the, here are some markers for you to think about. So suppose, suppose you have a large estate and someone's very, very like pretty old. I don't know how to put this. Let me put this another way. Um, if you transfer property from a, from a person who dies and the transfer is successfully made, you deed the property to your kids and you pass one year from the date of the transfer and the person dies one year and a day or thereafter, then they owe no tax on the property. Now, if it's children, it'd be a 4.5% tax, but on a million dollar property, that's $45,000. It ain't nothing, even though it's a little tiny percentage. So what you could do is if the elderly person really doesn't need the, that, that wealth, any assets that are passed down, the person survives for a year, but you have to be really sure they don't need the asset, either for a nursing home, or care, or whatever. So you have to be careful about gifting because there's something called the King Lear system, syndrome, where you give away all your assets and then you're howling in the wind and your kids have turned their back like, don't, don't want to do that to save taxes. So, um, so that's a that's a thing, and you could gift you can give portions of your estate away, but it doesn't make sense. You can also give parts of your estate to charity, but you're not taxed on that anyway. So, what really matters is if you have no kids and, and you have nieces and nephews, right, or or cousins. This makes a big deal because that's a fifteen percent tax. You have a million dollar estate; it's hundred fifty thousand dollars in tax if you can make some of the gifts during a lifetime. Then you can avoid some of that estate tax. So that's it. All right. Well, thank you so very much, Brian. <laughs> that's you. it. Maybe no more questions. Are there any other questions? Maybe Feel free to unmute yourself. People are like, oh ask. man, let's. Can I go now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, but no, that's okay. All right. Well, if right. no one else thank has you. any questions, I think we're going to uh, okay. sign off for the yeah. end. Oh, no, we have one more question, but you're going to wait. Okay. All right. Great. All right. It's been really... a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed this and learned a few things about estate administration. By your co-presenter Brian Gordon and Debbie Gross. <laughs> and I just want to say, if if anyone needs a copy of the PowerPoint, um, just make sure that that we have your email, and uh, we'll make sure that we can get it to you. I, we may not have your email, so. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Please. Yeah. You can give us. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you. Thank you to the library. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Olivia.
and go on our website pmconline.org and look at all of our other wonderful workshops that we have coming up in the next couple of months mm -hmm. yeah, valerie we will set we have your email from registering so we will send a copy of the powerpoint to all those who participated by zoom because we have your emails so thank you all right thank you all for joining us i'm going to sign off now take care